You'll spend a lot of time in applications working with strings. You'll be displaying information to users, and also a lot of the data that you'll be storing is in strings, names, addresses, email addresses, etc. So there are a wide variety of tasks that you might want to accomplish when you're working with strings. You might want to take a piece of text that represents someone's full name and separate out their first and last name. You might want to convert a string to all uppercase. You might want to take a string that represents the first name and a string that represents the last name and create a string that has last name followed by comma followed by first name. You might want to display numbers in the currency format with dollar signs and the cents after the dollars. And you might need to replace pieces of a string with another string. To accomplish all of these tasks, you can use the fields, properties, and methods that are provided by the string class. For example, the empty field represents an empty string. String.empty is the empty string. The length property of the string class returns the number of characters in a string. The cars property represents the character at a particular position in the string. So for example, you could find the character that's in the tenth position in a string. There are a number of methods provided by the string class that you can use to compare strings, to search for a string inside another string, to modify all or some of a string, to extract parts of a string, and to format the display of a string. To compare strings, you can use the compare method. This takes as parameters two strings. So you would say string.compare, then pass in the first string and the second string. And compare returns a negative number if the first string is less than the second, zero if they're equal, and a positive number if the first string is greater than the second. The equals method also takes two strings as a parameter and returns true if the two strings are equal, false otherwise. The compare to method is called on a particular string and takes as a parameter the string you want to compare to. So if you have a variable, for instance, last name, then you could write code that says last name dot compare to and then pass in as a parameter the string you want to compare somebody's last name to. Just like the compare method, compare to returns a negative number if the first string is less than the second, zero if they're equal, and a positive number if the first string is greater than the second. You can use the starts with, ends with, contains, and index of methods to test for the existence of a string in another string. These are four methods you can use to search in strings. They're all called as methods of the main string, and they take as a parameter the string you're searching for. The first three of these return true if the string you pass as a parameter is found in the first string, and index of returns an integer telling you where the string you're searching for starts. For example, if you had a string Robert space green, and you were searching for the string green, index of would return a 7, indicating that the string green started in the 8th position in the string Robert space green. Let's go see a demo. We'll look at the fields and properties of the string class, and then we'll look at how you use methods to compare and search for strings. I'm in the sample application. Let's take a look at fields and properties of the string class. First, I'm going to define a variable called my name as a string, and I'm going to assign it an empty string. I have two ways of determining if this string is empty. First, I can use the following expression, my name equals an empty string. And in fact, that returns that my name currently is nothing. I can also use string.empty to test if that string is empty. And in this case, that's true as well. So you can use string.empty or literally an empty string to test for empty strings. Well, let's put something in that string. We'll put my name in there. My name is Robert Green. We can use the length property of my name to determine how many characters are in there. 
and there are 12 characters in the string Robert Greene. We can use the cars property of the string class to look at individual characters. There are 12 characters in the string Robert Greene. The first one is character 0. So the characters will go from 0 to 11 in a string that has 12 characters in it. So my name dot cars parentheses 0 returns the first character which is a capital R. The last character is the length of 12 minus 1. So the characters go from 0 to 11. We use 0 for the first character, length minus 1, or 11, for the last character, and that's the lowercase n. Now let's look at some methods of the string class that we can use to compare and search in strings. We'll create two variables, author1, which is Ken Getz, and author2, which contains Robert Greene. Now we want to compare these. There are three ways we can do that. First, we can use the compare method of the string class and pass to it the first string, Ken Getz, and the second string, Robert Greene. The compare method will return a zero if these two strings are the same, or a negative number, or a positive number. In this case, it returns a negative number because the string Ken gets is less than the string Robert Green, and it's less than because the K comes before the R. We can also use the equals method of the string class and pass the two strings as parameters. This will return true if the strings are equal, false otherwise which it does in this case. And finally, we can use the compareTo method, which is called as a method of one of the strings. So here we're calling compareTo as a method of the second string and passing the first string as a parameter. This will return 0 if the two strings are the same, a positive number or a negative number, depending on which string is greater. So the results are, using compare, returned a negative number because we passed two strings, Ken gets, then Robert Green. We used the equals method of the string class, passed in the two strings, and determined that they were not equal. Then we called compare to on the second string and passed in the first string. And because the second string is greater than the first string, that result was displayed. Let's look at methods for searching in strings. Author1 is Ken Getz. And we'll use the starts with method to see if that string starts with the string Ken. In this case, it does. And this text is displayed. We can use the ends with method to see if that string ends with the string gets, and it does. Author2 is Robert Greene. We can use the contains method to see if this string contains the text Robert, whether it starts with, ends with, or it's in between. This will return true if the author2 string contains the text Robert. And finally, we can use the index of method to search for the string green inside Robert Green. Starts with, ends with, and contains return true if the second string is found in the first string. Index of returns an integer telling you where the string is found. If the string is not found, index of will return 0. If it is found, it returns a positive number. And in this case, because author2 is Robert space green, index of green will be equal to 7. The capital G is in the seventh position in the string Robert space green, remembering that the first character is character 0. So in this demo, you saw using the empty field and the length and cars properties of the string class, as well as using the compare equals and compare two methods to compare strings and the starts with ends with, contains, and index of methods to search for strings. 
there are a number of methods you can use to modify strings. Insert gives you the ability to add a string into another string, and you can specify where you want that new string added. You can use remove to remove all characters between two positions. You can specify the start position and then have everything after that removed. You can also specify a start and an end position and only remove the characters between the start and end point. You can use the replace method to replace part of a string with another string. You can replace one character at a time or you can replace multiple characters. Use the trim method to eliminate the white space from both the beginning and the end of a string. Trim start to eliminate the white space from the beginning of the string and trim end to eliminate white space from the end of the string. And you can use the pad left and the pad right methods to add white space or any character you want to the beginning or end of a string. And you can convert to uppercase using to upper and convert to lowercase using to lower. There are two methods you can use to extract strings. In other words, take part of a string and store it somewhere else. The first method is substring. You pass as the first parameter to the substring method the position that represents the start of the string you want to retrieve. And the second parameter, which is optional, specifies the length of string you want to retrieve. So if your string was Robert space green and you wanted to extract the green from that, you would pass as the first parameter the position where the string green starts which is position 7. If you didn't pass the second parameter, then substring would return everything from position 7 on, which is the string green. If your string was Robert Green is here, and you just wanted to extract green, you'd pass as the first parameter a 7, and then you'd pass 5, which is the length of the string you wanted to retrieve, and substring would then return green. The second option is to use the split method which will retrieve multiple parts of a string, whereas substring just retrieves one part of a string. The way split works is that you pass to it a parameter, an array that contains the characters that are used to separate parts of the string. So for example, if our string was Ken Getz, comma, Robert Green, then we would pass as a parameter an array that contained a comma. And that serves as instructions to the split method that the various parts of the string are separated with a comma. This method then returns an array that contains the parts of the string. So again, our example is we're splitting the string Ken Getz, comma, Robert Green. That would return an array with two elements, the first being Ken Getz, the second being Robert Green. Let's go to demo and we'll see how we do this in code. In the previous demo, we looked at methods of the string class for comparing and searching in strings. Now we'll look at methods for modifying and extracting strings. I'm going to run the useStringMethods code, and I've set a breakpoint about halfway down. This is the second half of the code we saw previously. So author1 is Ken Getz, and author2 is Robert Green. And now I want to insert into the author1 string. I want to add is the first author. And I want this to go at the end of the string. The insert method takes two parameters. One is the position of where you want the string to go, and the second is the new string you're adding. So I want this string to go starting in position 8, which is equal to the length of the string. So the string currently goes from position 0 through 7, and starting in position 8, I want to add is the first author. And so that gives me Ken Getz is the first author. Now in the string author 2, I want to add the second author is at the beginning of that. I will insert that at position 0, and this gives me the second author is Robert Greene. Now interestingly, the string author 1 is still Ken Getz, and the string author 2 is still Robert Green. Even though I inserted into 
author1 and I insert it into author2, I didn't actually change the values of author1 and author2. The string class is immutable, which means can't be changed. So a string variable cannot literally be changed. If you insert or remove, what you're actually doing is creating a copy of that string. And the original string is not actually changed. Next, I want to remove characters from the string. So I'm going to remove from string author2, which again is Robert Greene, everything after the fifth character. And that returns robber. So the capital R is character 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. So starting in the fifth character, which is the T, and everything to the end gets removed, and the result is the first five letters in that string. Or what I can do is starting in character number 3, remove only three characters. And that returns Rob Green. Again, position 0, 1, 2, 3, and remove three characters, brings back Rob Green. And again, author 2 is still Robert Green. Now I'm going to overwrite the contents of author 1 and author 2. And I'm going to do some replacing. So in the string author 1, which is the first author is Ken Getz, I'm going to replace the string Ken Getz with the string Robert Green. And now the first author is Robert Green. And now I want to replace the word is with a colon, and I wind up with the first author, colon, Ken Getz. And again, notice that the first author is back to Ken Getz because author 1 continues to be the first author is Ken Getz. So when I replaced Ken Getz with Robert Greene, I made a copy of that string and replaced Ken Getz with Robert Greene. The next time I work with that string, I'm still back to the original. Now I'll replace these two strings with these names and spaces, and we'll look at the trim functions. The trim method removes white space from the beginning and end of a string. So if we trim author1, that removes white space from the start and the end. Trim start removes white space from the beginning, Trim end removes white space from the end of a string. And we can use the pad methods to add either white space or characters to a string. So I'll set these strings back to just names. Then I'm going to call the pad left method of that first string, pass a 15, and that says pad the string on the left with white space until it is a total of 15 characters long. Or I can pass a character, in this case a dash, and I can pad with dashes instead of spaces. Pad right does the same thing, only at the end of the string. So here I've padded this string with white space at the end until it's 15 characters long, and in the second instance, I've padded with a dash. And then finally, I'll call the to upper and the to lower method to convert the string to uppercase and this string to lowercase. Now let's look at the substring and the split method and see how we can extract strings. I'll change the contents of author1 to the first author as Ken gets, and the second string to the second author, colon, Robert Green. Then I want to extract from these strings the author names. And for that, I'll use the substring method. The substring method takes, as a parameter, the position where you want to start extracting. So by calling substring on the author one string and passing 20, we're saying Extract from that string everything starting in character number 20 to the end. Alternatively, we can pass as a second parameter the number of characters we want extracted. 
So author one dot substring 20 comma one says go to the 20th character and extract one character, which is the capital K. Now maybe I don't know what position I want to start in. In this second string, I want to extract the author name. All I know is that the author's name starts two characters after the colon. So I need to pass to the substring method where the colon is. Well, for that, I can use the index of method and pass to it the colon as a character, not as a string. Author2 index of colon will return the index of where this colon is, and I know that the author name starts two after that. So by passing author2.index parentheses colon plus two, that will return everything that starts two characters after the colon, which is my name. And then finally, I can pass a three as the second parameter, and that says two characters after the colon, just return three characters. The split method gives me the ability to extract multiple pieces from a string, or a substring just gives me the ability to extract one part of a string. So I now define a variable course authors as a string that contains Ken Getz and Robert Greene separated by a comma. And I want to use the split method to extract Ken Getz and Robert Greene. And the results will be stored in an array. I pass into the split method an array of separators. So I create an array called separator list. It's an array of characters and it has two elements, a comma or forward slash. That's my way of telling the split method that the strings to be extracted are separated by either a comma or a forward slash. And the result will wind up in this array. So by calling split and passing the array of separators, we wind up with an array of strings that contains two elements, Ken Getz and Robert Greene. And I'll then display the first element and the second element like this. So what you've seen in this demo are various methods of the string class for modifying and extracting strings. We used insert to add strings, to remove characters, to replace one part of a string with another. We saw the trim and the pad methods to add white spacer characters or remove white spacer characters. We converted strings to upper and lower case with two upper and two lower. And then we used substring to extract part of a string from a string or split to break a comma delimited string up into an array of strings. So you've just seen lots of methods that you can use for manipulating strings. In addition to manipulating strings, you'll probably spend a fair amount of time displaying them. They do, after all, contain useful information that you might want your users to be able to see. There are a number of ways you can format strings and control how they're displayed. So for example, if you want to format a number, you can use the capital C or the little c format character to display a string as currency. Use D to display it as a decimal with no fractions, E to display in scientific form, F as a fixed point number, and you can specify how many decimal places you want, G to display in the general format, N to display as a number, and this will be displayed with commas separating the thousands, and a decimal point before the decimals. If your computer is set up to use the period to separate thousands and a comma to separate the decimals, then displaying using the number format will do that. And you can use the P format to display a number as a percent. If you're formatting dates, you also have a number of options. A little d displays a date in the short date pattern. 
and a capital D displays an along date pattern. Lowercase t displays a time using the short time pattern, and a capital T displays using the long time pattern. A lowercase f displays the date using the long date pattern and the time using the short time pattern, and the capital F displays the date using the long date pattern and the time in the long time pattern. A lowercase g displays the date in the short date pattern and the time portion in the short time pattern. The capital G displays the date in the short date pattern and the time in the long time pattern. M displays the date using the month day pattern with no year, and Y displays in the month year pattern without the day. The final thing we want to look at in building strings is building strings efficiently. Remember that strings are immutable, so each time you use a string operator, you're creating a new string. This is true whether you're adding two strings together or whether you're replacing pieces of a string or removing pieces of a string. And because you're always creating a new copy of a string, building strings using the string operators can be inefficient. A more efficient way to build a string is to use the String Builder class, because this builds a string that can be changed. The String Builder class is in the system.txt namespace in the .NET framework and provides a number of methods you can use to build a string. Append to add a string to the end of an existing string. Append line will add a string followed by a line break. You can use insert to add a string into an existing string. You can replace all occurrences of one string with another string with the replace method, and you can use the remove method to remove strings. So let's go see our final string demo, and we'll look at formatting strings and also using the String Builder class. Let's take a look at how we can format strings to control how they're displayed. I'm going to create a variable called total amount. It's an integer, and it's equal to 12124624. Now we want to display this. We're going to display this using different formats. We'll display this as a currency, as a decimal, in the scientific and fixed point formats, then using the general, number, and percent formats. I'm going to right click on this line here and run to cursor. And now let's see the results. So here's that number displayed as a currency in decimal format, in the scientific format, in the fixed point format, general as a number, and using the percent format. And we accomplish that by specifying the format code in the placeholder in the right line method of the console class. We can do the exact same thing using the format method of the string class. That's another way to format strings. So let's run through that group of code and you'll see that we get the exact same results. We're using the same format codes, but we're using string.format. The third way you can display a string is to use the toString method. And there again, we pass the format codes to the toString method, and we'll get the same results for a third time. So whether you're using console.writeline to display, strings, string.format to display strings, or to string to display strings, they all accept the same format codes. That shows us how to format and display the string representation of an integer. Let's look at how we can format the display of dates. So we'll create a new date called next century as January 1st, 2100, and we'll display that using different formats. Let's see the results. Here, the date is displayed using the short date format of 1 1 2100. The long date format gives us the day of the week, the month, the day, and the year. The short time format includes hours and minutes. The long time format includes hours, minutes, and seconds. 
when we used the lowercase f, that displayed the state using the long date format and the short time format, and the capital F displayed in the long date format and the long time format. The lowercase g displayed short date, short time format, capital G displays short date, long time format. Then the M displays the month and the day, and the Y displays the month and the year. Change that to avoid future confusion. Now let's do this using the string dot format. And there again, you see the same results. And finally, using the to string. And there we have the same results again using to string. So whether you're using console.writeline, string.format, or to string, all three of those support the use of the format codes. Finally, let's look at the string builder class as a way of building strings more efficiently. I've got two strings, author1 and author2, and I want to build a string that shows which author wrote which chapter. So here's the inefficient way. First, I create the variable authors as another string, and then I set that equal to author1 plus wrote chapter1 plus carriage return line feed plus author2 wrote chapter2 plus carriage return line feed all the way down through chapter 6. And what I wind up with is a string that contains the right information, but I've done this inefficiently, and that's because every time you add two strings together, you're creating another string. So this creates a string, and then this creates another string, and then this creates another string, and so on and so on. And although you wind up with the results you wanted, this is a very inefficient way of building a string. The more efficient way is to use the string builder class, which is contained in the system.txt namespace. So at the top of this code, I have imports system.txt, and then I can use the string builder class without identifying the namespace it's in. So now authors is a new instance of the string builder class and I can take advantage of the append and append line methods to build my string. So let's run down to here. Now authors, it's not a string, it's an instance of the string builder class, but it contains 168 characters, which is the contents of the string that I built. We can display that using right line, and we wind up with the results we expected. We can also make changes to this. So we'll insert at character zero the string course authors and a carriage return line feed. And now we've added at the top of this string a heading. Next, we're going to create another instance of the string builder class. We'll take that instance of the string builder class next chapter and we'll insert that into authors starting at position 185. And the result of that is we've added to the string the author of chapter 7. We can replace inside the string, so we're going to replace all instances of Ken Gets with Ken, and all instances of Robert Green with Robert, and the result is authors by first name only. And finally, we can remove so we'll remove, starting at character 0, 16 characters, and we wind up with no heading. So here you've seen using the String Builder class as a much more efficient way of building strings. Now if you're just adding two strings together, for example, hello and world, nothing wrong with using the string operator. But if you're building strings that involve a lot of manipulation, this example here we were adding a lot of strings together, or you're spending a lot of time manipulating the contents of strings, then you should consider using the String Builder class because it creates one string that can be changed as opposed to creating another string every time you change a string. 
When you work with dates and times in your code, these are represented by the date time structure, which is in the .NET framework in the system name space. Date and time intervals are represented by the time span structure. So you'll use date time to refer to a date or a time, and you'll use time span to refer to a range of dates or a range of times. The date time structure provides a number of properties for determining various parts of a date or time. Today returns the current date. Now returns the current date and time. And those have a number of components to get more specific, such as the date, month, day, year, the day of the week, the day of the year, the time of the day, the hour, minute, second, all the way down to millisecond. And we'll see these in the demo shortly. You can convert a datetime variable to strings. The datetime structure provides some methods for converting the date to a string. For example, you can use the toLongDateString method to display a date in long format. Use the toLongTimeString method to display the time in the long format. Use to short date string to display the date in the short format, and to short time string to display a time using the short format. You can also use various methods to find dates in the future or the past. You can add days to a date or add months. You can add years. You can add hours, minutes, seconds, and milliseconds to a time. And you can add positive numbers to move into the future and negative numbers to move into the past. The time span structure represents a duration of time, which could be the duration between now and five minutes from now. It could be the duration of time between today and sometime next month. The time span structure itself is measured in ticks, which is 100 nanoseconds. Now, it doesn't necessarily do you any good to know how many hundred nanoseconds there are between today and sometime next week. So you'll use various properties of the time span structure to determine components of a date or time. For example, days returns the number of whole days in an interval, or hours, minutes, seconds, milliseconds. These all return whole parts of an interval. If you want fractional days or hours, etc., then you use total days, total hours, total minutes, total seconds, and total milliseconds. So you can get components of a date or time in whole intervals or whole in fractions. Let's go see a demo of using the date, time, and the time span structure and how you use these various methods and components. I have the sample app running. Let's look at properties of the date time structure. First, we'll look at datetime.today and datetime.now. Datetime.today returns today's date as of midnight. Datetime.now returns today's date and the current time. A date time structure always has a date and a time, so both of these have a date and a time element. It's just that today does not include the current time, whereas now does. So if all you want to know is what the date is, you can use either of these. If you need to know the current time, then you'll use now. Let's look at how to break the date and time into various pieces. We'll look at date, time, dot now, dot date, month, day, year. We'll look at the day of week and the day of the year, and then the time of day, and the hour, and the minute, and the second. Let's run all of those and see the results. The date portion of date, time, dot now is today's date as of midnight. And notice that this is the same result that we got when we used today. So date time dot today is today's date at midnight, and the date portion of date time dot now is the same thing, because you're asking only for the date. Here's the month, day, and year portion of today's date. It's a Monday. Here's the time of day portion of the time, hours, minutes, seconds, and fractions of seconds. And here's hour, minute, and second. So we can use these various pieces to break down 
the date or the time into more discrete units. Now let's create a new date time structure and set it equal to January 1st in the year 2100. When you create a date time, you specify the year, the month, and the day. So now, next century is equal to January 1st, 2100. We'll then display the date, day of week, and month, day, and year portion of that. And we see that January 1st, 2100 falls on a Friday, and it's month one, day one, in the year 2100. That's properties of the date time structure. Let's now look at methods of the date time structure. First, we'll look at the various methods that convert a date time into a string. Short date string, long date string, and short time string and long time string. So here's today's date in short date, long date format, and the current time in short time and long time format. So these methods are yet another way of displaying a date as a string and formatting it. And they serve the same purpose as the D and the T format characters that we saw in an earlier demo. Next, we're going to create another date time. This variable is called other date time. And then we're going to set it equal to today's date plus five days. So in other words, five days from now. And we'll display that. Then we'll set it to five months ago and 10 years ago. And we see that five days from today, five months ago and 10 years ago. We can also add to time. So for example, we'll take the current time and add five hours, then subtract 10 minutes, and finally add 100 seconds, and see that five hours from now, 10 minutes ago, and 100 seconds from now. So that's a look at methods of the date time structure. Now let's look at the time span structure, which represents an interval of time. So here, I'm going to create a variable called right now, which is equal to date time now. Then I want to know how many minutes are left in this hour, how many hours are left in this day, and how many days are left in this month. And then I want to know how many seconds are left in this minute, how many minutes are left in this hour, and how many hours are left in this day. So I'm going to create three new date time variables. Next minute will be a date time that contains this year, this month, this day, whatever hour it is one minute from now, whatever minute it is one minute from now, and zero seconds. Then we'll create a date time variable called next hour, which contains this year, this month, this day, whatever hour it is one hour from now, zero minutes, zero seconds. And finally, next day, which will be this year, this month, whatever day it is one day from now, at midnight. So I'll create next minute, next hour, next day. Then I'll display now as a reference. And now I want to find intervals. I'm going to create this variable time remaining as a time span equal to next minute minus right now. And then I'll display how many seconds are in that interval. Then we'll look at an interval consisting of next hour minus right now and display how many minutes are in that interval. And our last interval is next day minus right now and we'll display how many hours are in that interval. Next, I'm going to create two date time variables. The first date is equal to today. 
the second date is equal to December 31st in the year 2099. Then I'll create a time span equal to the difference between December 31st, 2099 and today. I'll display today as a reference. And then I want to know how many days, hours, and seconds are left in the century. I'll use the total days property of the interval to find the whole number of days, total hours to find the number of hours as whole hours, and total seconds to find the number of seconds as whole seconds. So you've seen in this demo, using the date time structure and the time span structure to work with dates and times.